Hey guys, it's Paul from Online Tax Academy. In today's lesson, we're going to be taking a look at a live version of Maceo Parker playing over the funk classic Pass the Peas. Now, Maceo Parker is one of the all-time great saxophone players, and he really specialised playing in a funk style. Now, no matter what kind of style of sax you like to play, there's so much you can learn from the way he plays. Firstly, you can learn so much from his sense of time and rhythm, and that's a good foundation no matter what style you're interested in playing. And then there's the amazing way he improvises with relatively simple things, like just a blues scale, but still manages to make it sound amazing. So he's a great sax player to study if you're starting to learn to improvise as well, as you can see what's possible just with a simple scale. And then for the more advanced players and improvisers out there, we're also gonna be looking at how he crafts this solo and how he builds the tension up until a climax towards the end. Now what I've got here is the concert pitch transcription, and that's available to download free at onlinetaxacademy.com, and the link to that is down below. And premium members at Online Tax Academy can get the alto sax version and the tenor sax version, both with and without the note names written underneath. So this solo section for Pass the Peas is essentially just jamming over one chord. All right, so let's check out this first phrase. So straight away that first phrase is amazing. When you're reading funk rhythms, it can look a bit intimidating because we've got all these 16th notes everywhere. One thing that can be really helpful is to mark in where the beats are. So if we put in our one is here, beat two starts on this rest here. There's three and here's four. So you can see these first three notes, they're in between the beats. We have like four, one, ba, 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 da, 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 ba, which is such a great rhythm to start with. Yeah, have another listen. And at the end here, we've got this really cool kind of like fall, but up. Normally when we're falling, we're going down the scale, but this is quite a nice effect where you run up the sax. Have another listen. Now what's really characteristic is his short attacking articulation, particularly on these offbeat notes. Notice how this on beat is actually quite long, but these off beats are really short. And he's always ending with these kind of short punchy notes here. Now, if we look at the notes he's using in this phrase as well and kind of reorder them from the lowest up to the highest, we've got a D, F, G, A flat, A, C, and a high D. We've got, that's your D minor blues scale. And for these first four measures, that's all he's using. Okay, so we'll play it from the beginning, but now we're gonna check out the second line as well. Now, if you check out these notes all the way up to here and these notes here, we've got exactly the same notes. There's no grace note on this A flat, but other than that, all the notes are the same. It's just a slightly different rhythm. We start with those same offbeat 16th notes. And then we're running into those sets of 16ths. And this is what gives it that sense of melody because we've got those same musical hooks at the beginning of each of the phrases. Here's the first one. And then here's the next one. So it's almost the same. And you'll see how he takes this idea of repetition and uses it to build tension right up to the extreme later on. All right, now moving on to the next set of eight bars. So coming down to here, this is where we start to introduce some other notes that aren't in the blues scale. So this is from measure five. So the note that really catches your ear is this B here. So, so far we've just been sticking to the blues scale. But the B, this is the sixth note of D minor. And when we're in D minor, that B natural has like a real kind of floaty quality to it. Now along with this here, he's including that note from the blues scale, but it doesn't really sound very bluesy here because we've got this note B as well. But when you include it with a note B, you get this almost like mysterious sound that kind of comes from the A harmonic minor. Yeah, have another listen to it. At the end of this four measure phrase, we get this transition into this new idea of repeating the note, this is the note D on the alto sax. And you can play that middle D in different ways. And the way he's doing it here is with O, I'm thinking of that as just like the ordinary way of doing it. And with the plus sign, he's using the alternative fingering of just using the palm key, which you'd normally use for the high D, but he's not putting the octave key on. It can be a really cool effect to switch between those two kinds of Ds. And he sets that up at the end of this four measure phrase, and that's kind of the theme for the next four measures. Check it out, we'll go from those last two beats of measure eight. So 
but this is just like an amazing masterclass in rhythm because if you look at the notes he's basically only using two notes we've got the note f and g here now he's using the alternative fingering as kind of almost like a quieter version of the note and then when he lands on the proper fingering that tends to be pushed out harder and more accented and that variation with the two kinds of Ds played with such amazing rhythm is all you need to make this phrase sound amazing. Now again, in the fourth measure, he's treating that as like a transition measure. So we're using this as a chance to break away from this kind of musical tension we've built up. You'll find that if you repeat the same note or group of notes over and over in interesting rhythms, it starts to create kind of melodic tension. And then when you break out of that into a new idea, it's what gives the music loads of forward momentum. And he's also breaking out of that in this fourth measure to get ready for the next idea in the next like four measure phrase. Yeah, check out this measure 12, this transition bar. <laughs> Now he develops this idea of just playing with a couple of notes. Now though, what's really interesting is he keeps coming back to this note C here, and that's the highest note of this bar. And you'll see that kind of every other note, he's pretty much hitting this C. And in between those notes, he's alternating between A's and A flats. And it's kind of going A, A flat, A, A flat. And every now and then he'll dip down and hit a G as well. But the C is there in between all the time. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> And that's such a great way to build more melodic tension. It's also higher than where we were before. So here we were playing around with the notes F and G, and now we've stepped up and we're playing with the notes kind of A and C. Now, moving on to the next four measure phrase, you can see how he's continuing with this idea, but now the top note he's hitting is the note D. And he's continuing with that idea of hitting D every other note in the beginning, and he starts to break away from it towards the end. <laughs> And then after this kind of more chaotic line of bouncing between those three notes, he just settles on this note C here and just bangs it out with amazing rhythm. And then for this next four measure phrase here, we're keeping with the idea of the Cs, but he's now introducing that B, the sixth that we had earlier. So this isn't in the blues scale, but it's really nice to play with against the note C because they're just a semitone apart. And yet again, notice how in his fourth measure here, this is kind of like a transition into our new idea for the next four measure phrase. But have a listen to this bit first. <laughs> And then here's the transition here. All right, so after that transition phrase, the next four measure phrases we're getting into like the climax of the solo. This is the highest note he's held so far. It's also one of the longest he's held as well. But we're still building tension as then he falls back to the notes F and E. Now E is another one of those notes that wasn't in the blues scale, but it's a nice one. It also pairs up nicely with the F, like how the C and the B was played around with earlier because they're just a semitone apart. F and E, again, they're only a semitone apart as well. He's also splitting those notes as well. It sounds like a bit of a growl. If you vocalize as you're playing, if you put like a slight hum as you're blowing, like that can help split the note and give it that growling sound. And then to finish off, we're going into this kind of really nice riff that he plays. And he's literally just repeating this same riff over and over. And you'll hear how the trombone clocks it and joins in with him. Now, sometimes these riffs are prearranged in this kind of jam setting and you can use it as a way to indicate, yeah, this is the end of my solo. And you can say like, when I've played this riff four times in a row, that's it, it's the end of my solo. Now, I don't know if they prearranged this hook or not, if it just came about naturally, but that's a nice tactic you can use to indicate the end of your solo if you're playing over the kind of a one chord jam style tune. Yeah, check it out, it goes like this. <laughs> Not 
right, and that's the end of the solo. So this is just an absolute masterclass in how to build a solo, basically with just a blues scale and two other notes. He's including the second and the sixth occasionally. But the reason why this is so effective and doesn't just sound like he's noodling around on a blues scale is because there's still a sense of structure. He's thinking in like four measure chunks and he's using the fourth measure often as a way to transition into the next idea and that kind of smooths it and doesn't make it sound quite so blocky. And then from measure 13 onwards, each four bar chunk basically consists of two or three notes which he's repeating in a rhythmical way and each chunk is getting higher and higher and that's what's creating this sense of climax. And of course, this is all executed with his amazing sense of time and articulation. Now, if you're interested in learning how to improvise and create solos like this, then over at Online Sax Academy, I have a Learn to Improvise course, which steps you through right from the very beginning. And also at the moment, I'm starting to create a Mastering Rhythm course as well. And every couple of weeks, I'm releasing a new lesson for that. And that's gonna help you, particularly playing in these kinds of styles where rhythm is so important and you've gotta be able to feel these 16th notes. All right, that's it for today. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this one. And remember, you can get the free PDF download at onlinesaxacademy.com and of course premium members you've got those transposed versions as well. All right I'll see you guys next week.